Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to see everyone again, and hopefully, uh, you, hopefully, if everyone has been uh, engaged completely, as I know you have been, uh, there'll be very little new information here, but there'll be some surprises here. Um, and yes, I want to talk about uh, cardiovascular mortality. Uh, you know, the gentleman who was running things did a great job yesterday of turning that uh, monitor so I could see it. Maybe we could do that again. Not that I don't know what's on the slides, but sometimes there are some details. There you go. All right. So uh, you know, those of you who have heard me speak, you know that I'm a fan of history. Um, and uh, as I'm starting this talk about cardiovascular mortality, I want to start talking about some history. Uh, last year was very special <clears throat> because the century turned into an adult. It had turned 18 years of age. At a president of the United States uh, who uh, every day seemed to be in some kind of political trouble. You had uh, Russia still in conflict with the Ukraine over the Crimea. And uh, I know it's not a popular thing in New York, but the Boston Red Sox did a really good job of dominating the American League and uh, pounding uh, their opponent in the World Series. And those of you who've regularly heard me speak before probably know I'm not talking about 2018. I'm talking about 1918. So, yeah, and it was the Cubs they trounced. <laughs> uh, in 1918, there was a, a global epidemic, okay? It was the Spanish flu. It killed millions of people around the world, uh, killed over 650,000 Americans in one year. That epidemic lasted three years, okay? But by 1919, cardiovascular disease was back as the leading cause of death, despite this horrific epidemic. And it's been the number one cause of death in the United States ever since. There was nothing that an epidemic like this could do, uh, and we've had loads of issues come up. Non-communicable diseases have now taken over around the world. Um, but the communicable diseases, they, they would come and they would go. Cardiovascular disease, still number one. So the question I have for you as an audience is, what are we going to do about it? I know you're here because you're interested in changing your own health and the health of the people around you, your families, your neighborhoods. Uh, less time. Let, it, the time has come. If not now, when? Uh, if not us, who? We have to make a, a difference. Okay, so armed with that uh, motivational speech, I'm going to start talking about uh, what it is that we could and should be doing about cardiovascular mortality. Uh, this is kind of an outline. I'll deviate a little bit from it about uh, making sure that everybody knows the facts about the heart disease burden, then go into the things that I think are at the top of the list of uh, ruining cardiovascular health in this country uh, and around the world. Uh, yes, that was, uh, one, it was about one out of three deaths, but they say it's on the increase um, again. And since I gave that introduction in uh, more than 40 seconds, more than one American died. And probably if you look at that last bullet point down there, it's not about the cost or, or things like that, but how about uh, the specific population that I come from, the African American uh, population? About 50% of all African Americans have some form of heart disease, and a lot of it has to do with nutrition. Globally, we have exported, how many of you have been to another country? How many of you saw an American franchise in that country? Yes, and so we have exported um, the fast food industry to other places uh, and the conveniences of um, you know, not having to work in the fields as the economic status uh, improves uh, globally has led to this kind of global epidemic of hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, if you look at what we've done in cardiology, we always brag about, and I think appropriately so, how many lives we have saved. And if you look, uh, you can see that uh, over a four-decade period, <coughs> excuse me, four-decade period, we had about a 70% decrease in cardiovascular mortality, really dramatic. And uh, there are luminaries in the field, and I was you know, really fortunate to be a resident at Emory when Andreas Grunzig came and uh, did the first angioplasty in the United States, and that balloon angioplasty 
you know, sort of led to doing stents, and stents uh, have gotten so much better that you know, we do them all the time. Well, the issue is that we have gotten to the point that all of those advancements in cardiology, uh, first of all, have not been extended to every aspect of our society. And so we do have, um, uh, this is the African-American experience, and you kind of stare at that, coming from the uh, Center for Disease Control. You stare at that curve, that dotted line that says that we don't have the same decrease level uh, in the African-American community. And most people are looking at the sort of vertically, uh, the difference in the number of deaths. I'm looking at it horizontally. How long does it take the African-American community to catch up? It's about 11 years, okay? 11 years behind in terms of the drop in mortality. Um, if you look at heart disease in men, there was a very steady decline starting from the beginning. If you look at it in women, we, it took us a while to recognize heart disease in women and to start to deal with the fact that women can present with uh, different symptoms. They have to be taken seriously. And it shouldn't take episodes of Grey's Anatomy and Miranda Bailey having a heart attack uh, for people to recognize that this has been a problem for a while and we need to improve it. Still, we're mopping up the floor instead of turning off the faucet. When are we going to uh, stop the people from falling in the river instead of trying to drag them out? And part of what we're, we're dealing with is our obesity epidemic. Uh, it is an increasing problem, and if, if I could point to one thing that's going to make it change, it's this slide. Seven things that everyone should do. It would decrease the obesity, it would decrease the, um, uh, the cardiovascular mortality issues that if we, if we summarized everything, it would be it. We need to be active, we need to be exercising. How much? Well, we're working on that, and you'll see some guidelines come out, um, and they will say um, that, uh, based on the literature, that people should be doing at least 150 minutes of exercise every week, um, that uh, if that's for sort of maintenance and prevention. If you're talking about treatment, you're probably closer to 300 minutes a week, and people should be really dedicated to their exercise program. Is that the most important thing? Um, between our lifestyle issues, there, and there are a variety of them, Nutrition versus exercise is probably about 80-20. That is four times more important. To, that is, you cannot exercise your way out of a bad diet. And you see the exercise gurus who look perfectly fit, who then have a heart attack, are then are, are good examples of that. But keeping a healthy weight is important, and exercise really does help that as well as cal calorie control. Having your cholesterol well controlled Less than 100 for uh, an LDL cholesterol, if you are the general primary prevention uh, population, if you have disease, you really want it less than 70 or even lower, as low as you can get it. No one should be smoking under any circumstances. Everyone should be doing a heart-healthy diet. Notice that I've colored that in green. And the blood pressure. We had a great discussion about this yesterday, how we have new definition that an elevated blood pressure is 120 or above. Everybody should be shooting to be in the teens. Um, not that we use drugs below 130, we don't, but we should be doing everything we can to get the blood pressure down uh, to that really healthy level. And we, everybody should be screened for high uh, blood sugar, uh, checking a hemoglobin A1C, even checking a fasting blood sugar. Everyone should have this information. If we're armed with the information, then we can fight the battle. Oh yeah, that 3%. That's how many of our kids in the United States uh, in adolescent years actually hit all seven of those. Uh, that's atrocious. That's something that we're all going to pay for in the future if we don't fix it. And there's my cardiovascular mortality curve showing that from the CDC that uh, the decrease has stopped, and um, there's been an increase in the absolute number of heart disease deaths in the United States over the last few years. Um, and so my career goal of being number two uh, may not actually work. Our obesity epidemic is at the center of that, according to the CDC, um, that the 78 million obese adults, they're becoming diabetic, hypertensive, uh, having cardiac events. And it's really what we do. It's our culture. Um, healthy dining is difficult uh, because all the meals are so large. Uh, calories really do matter. And so uh, not eating enough fruit, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, uh, this is, uh, that's according to Harvard uh, School of Public Health. These are the things that lead to the obesity epidemic and stop us from having healthy lives. Um, so I, I always showed this slide 
talking about over you know, a 60-year period how fast food has increased, not just in, in, uh, in usage, but in, in, in size and calories. Um, but then this got published a couple months ago saying that there are segments of the population who eat um, uh, fast food on a daily basis. And in fact, my African-American population is one of the highest in the United States, with one third of people eating uh, fast food every day. Uh, so we do have issues, particularly in women with uh, obesity and being overweight. Um, not Hispanic, African-American women, 56 or 57% uh, being obese. Uh, these are issues that are you know, difficult to uh, bring up, but this is something that we all have to deal with. And it's not about shaming, it's about changing the culture. So, do you have any Phoenix Cardinals fans? <laughs> In the, in the, I mean, this was uh, something that came out during the exhibition season. Uh, they put on this seven pound, $75 burger. I can tell you, it costs more than $75, okay? Um, because it's gonna cost the people's health. And so um, if you finish that burger with all of those things in it in less than an hour, they would put your picture up on the scoreboard and give you a jersey, okay? Uh, they didn't, and the, the, the bottom line of that slide is the surprising part to me that they, that they road tested it on their culinary staff. They got sick uh, and they went on ahead with it anyway. Um, so that tells us where we are. We have so much more palatable and affordable foods. We have a society that has less physical demands. Uh, there's a lot more screen time. Uh, mo everyone here is guilty. Tell, tell me who here does not have a smartphone or an iPad or a computer. Is there anyone? Oh my gosh, <laughs> there are two, three, amazing. Okay, all right, well, I, you know, I applaud you. Of course, I wouldn't hire you <laughs> because, because, I mean, this is the way we live. It's unfortunate, uh, but, um, <laughs> but uh, we've got to get to the point where we understand that screen time is important, and uh, I think the newest software actually tells you every now and then what your screen time is like, and I, I think that's a very helpful kind of thing. So don't be afraid, you can, jo you can join the digital revolution. Oh, oh my gosh, that's even better, self-employed. All right, um, do we get enough sleep? Probably not. Um, and if you, but probably the, the biggest contribution has to be this concept of, uh, at, that Juliana Hever and others have put out in a very nice way, uh, showing you, you know, the fat you eat, it's the fat you wear because it's so calorie dense. And so uh, what does 400 calories look like? Totally different depending on what it is that you're actually eating. So I want to try to take um, the discussion of the output of, of these risk factors into uh, uh, heart health. And that was done so very well by the Adventist Health Studies. And those of you who are not familiar with Gary Fraser and all his work, it's worth talking about uh, because uh, they have always asked people to do that number two line there, uh, lacto-ovo-vegetarian. And there are some people who ignore all that and say, I'm not going to eat any animal products, a lot of them in Southern California, but all over the country. Then there are people who uh, eat fish on top of it, those who eat a standard American diet, that bottom line, and then some who just cut the animal products to some degree. But the bottom line is he's got five different diets, and he can follow people, uh, see when they're changing their diet, uh, say, <coughs> excuse me, see whether they're getting heart disease uh, and all the risk factors, and he's accumulated a, a massive amount of data, which is so insightful to, for those of us who are trying to uh, navigate uh, the health and relate them to the risk factors. So here you have it. Which of those five diets has a body mass index less than 25, meaning that on average they are not overweight? It's only the vegans, okay? Um, the, the incidence of diabetes gets cut by almost 80%. Uh, the incidence of uh, hypertension gets cut by 75%, as we mentioned yesterday. Uh, and on top of that, there is a mortality difference um, because we've had some issues, in, uh, particularly in cardiology, where there will be a drug that will improve your risk factors, but it doesn't improve your life expectancy. That's not what we're looking for. Um, it's a stronger signal in men because of the uh, number of deaths uh, that they had. Um, but the um, vegetarian versus non-vegetarian diet really did reduce heart attack uh, deaths and overall cardiovascular disease 
uh, by about 30%. Uh, this is my favorite Gary Fraser slide, looking over the decades at what happens to uh, diet. And you see that uh, there, that green in the front, the vegan diet, becomes more and more popular. I would love to see in a few years them publish what happens to the 80-year-olds. I suspect that the green will outweigh the red, uh, not just because the people on standard American diet are dying. I hope that's not the case. It's hopefully it's that they're changing. Uh, to a more healthy diet so that they can uh, be a healthy 80-year-old. And so um, this is, if you look at, uh, and some people really want to know, are you really improving life expectancy? I know Dean Ornish's uh, favorite line is, am I going to live longer or is it just going to seem like it? <laughs> uh, well, the answer is you really are going to live longer, okay? And so uh, the longevity data um, said that you're basically adding, if you're a man, you're adding about nine and a half years to your life expectancy, women about six years uh, longer than, than the other people. But there are loads of other uh, findings in the Adventist health studies. Um, other than being underweight, um, they actually have less insulin resistance, of course, as I'll mention in, in a bit. Uh, those, the fact that they're lean seems to mean that they're going to exercise more regularly. Um, more regularly, they tend to do other healthy behaviors, uh, avoiding cigarettes, um, eating plants, um, and they. So each of their risk factors are actually uh, set up in a different way, and you know that becomes one of the major criticisms of the outcomes data that it really isn't the diet; it's the fact that the people are different. They're doing everything different. Well, I'll take the everything. Okay, because we want to decrease, I'm, I'm desperately trying to reduce cardiovascular disease by any means necessary. Or was I supposed to say any greens necessary? Right? Okay. So, um, yeah. And so, if, if you look at our African American population, there are a fair number of African American um, uh, Adventists, and I'll talk about some of that data in, in a bit. Increasing lifespan by six years, uh, we're not catching up to the, um, the non African American population, but we're going to keep trying. Uh, how about the diabetes? Um, I threw this one here because it was published just a few months ago, and it was very insightful. Um, I was looking at the data for um, improving uh, diabetes, and a lot of people in the vegan community saying we can we can cure diabetes. And so, what's the data behind it? The data is actually pretty good. Um, it does lower A1C, total cholesterol, but uh, blood glucose. But guess what else? Emotional well-being, all of the stuff that we hear that you go vegetarian, you become depressed, uh, none of that data uh, seems to be uh, real. It's more anecdotal. And the fact of the matter is if you do the quality of life scores uh, and depression scores, people are actually better off. They feel better, more energetic, um, better emotional well-being, as well as improvement in, in the um, uh, risk factors. But let's get back to risk factors. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday, so I'll go through it fairly quickly, that High blood pressure is our major issue globally, um, and that if you do a vegetarian diet, you will decrease your blood pressure uh, when you make that switch. Um, this is the meta-analysis. You don't have to see the, the names of the authors. Um, I think that one lady can see it. <laughs> okay, But for, for the rest of us, we're just looking at the trend versus the vertical line, and the vast majority of that data is on the left side saying that you're going to get a mild, moderate, or marked decrease in your blood pressure if you uh, change to a plant-based diet. Why is that so important to me? Because it's a general drag on our economy. The amount of healthcare dollars that were being spent is, is tremendously high. Uh, and this got published uh, last year. <clears throat> Medicare trustees saying that uh, that system that so many people, even in this room, rely on uh, is going to be insolvent in 2026. Now, of course, we could throw more money at it, but how about more throwing more health at it instead, okay? And one of the best ways to do that, <laughs> one of the best ways to do that really is uh, to control hypertension because that is the number one condition uh, that Medicare treats. We do have new guidelines, and I, if I'm throwing this up here because it's so important, and I know it's a duplicate for some of you who were here yesterday, uh, but for those who, who weren't, uh, we really have uh, new guidelines that talk not just about drugs, but talk specifically about lifestyle things that we can do. Adding aerobic exercise, dynamic resistance exercise, isometric resistance exercise, moderating alcohol consumption, 
uh, increasing potassium consumption, decreasing sodium, decreasing body weight, and most important, in large, bold, green letters, changing your diet so that you have fruits, vegetables, whole grains. The low-fat dairy was part of the DASH diet, and people will say, well, we don't want any dairy, that's fine. Um, it's probably not the key indicator to improve uh, your health. It would probably, if I had to pick one thing out of it, it would be based on the Intermap study from Jeremiah Stanler at Northwestern saying that whole grains are the, the moderator of hypertension uh, because of the glutamic acid content in, in those grains. Uh, that has the largest impact on, uh, uh, on blood pressure. That was actually shown by the DASH people that the more vegetarian you are, that's the red line, the larger the drop in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. It, it's a very expensive disease, and if we were to take that Gary Fraser data and say, oh yeah, everybody goes vegan, you drop your blood pressure, uh, hypertension incidence um, by 75%, we would save a massive amount of money. Okay. <coughs> Let's talk about sugar. And um, those of you who have heard me speak before, you might notice that this slide now has sweeteners uh, in it as well, because we have similar issues. Uh, we had a great discussion last night about fruit and um, you know whether people should be eating it, and I pulled the banana and the orange out of my pocket. <laughs> and uh, obviously, um, I, I, was, I was talking about um, modulation of fructose absorption, uh, and Dr. Brenda Davis did a great uh, description of it as well with fiber. And so uh, and for, for those of you, either please look us up on the internet or take a picture of the slide. Uh, I'd like to, everyone to understand that if you're eating fruit that has a lot of sugar without the fiber, and that would be mostly grapes and anything on sort of the left side, uh, the left upper portion of the graph, um, that's not going to be as good in terms of modulating your insulin response to, to food. Uh, as it would be if you were eating the things that are on the lower side. And so, yes, there's a lot of vegetables packed at the bottom where there's a lot of fiber and not much sugar at all. And then there are fruits that just have a lot of fiber, like raspberries and blueberries. They weren't my, uh, or uh, blackberries. I, they weren't my favorite until I saw that slide, and suddenly they are, because I want my insulin modulated. Um, so what happens? People say, well, you know, fructose may be handled differently. Well, when you eat uh, fructose, glucose, sucrose, or even white bread, which is the refined flour, you get the same response. It's a dose-related insulin response. That insulin actually causes uh, insulin resistance, ultimately, because of the obesity. The obesity is because insulin is really effective at driving nutrients into cells, particularly fat into fat cells. And so all of the hypertension, high triglycerides, um, uh, result in plaque development. And that's how we end up with heart disease. So if I had to pick out one thing I wouldn't want people to have, it's high levels of insulin. Sugar itself, uh, uh, other than what it does to insulin, it actually does increase triglyceride levels, um, increases total cholesterol. Your good cholesterol goes down. Your LDL cholesterol has more sugar coating to it, which makes it more likely to uh, form clots or to promote clots. And all of this is reversible if people will stop eating the sugar. So with that background, it's pretty easy to understand uh, sort of getting away from the science for a moment and going to the epidemiology. You can actually understand why uh, the uh, large cohorts of, of data will say something like this curve. This is actually um, Journal of American Medical Association in 2014. And I'm so sorry when it came out because it meant that I had to give up my vegan Oreos, okay? <coughs> but what it basically shows is that there's a curvilinear relationship between ingested sugar and mortality. Uh, and now you know why, but now you know that it actually, actually does exist. The surprise to many of us was uh, last year when people started talking about sweetened beverage and we're looking, wait a minute, all of our advocacy, all of our laws uh, where we're trying to change things, we're talking about sugar sweetened beverages, aren't we? Turns out not, okay? It's sweetened beverages, and it doesn't matter whether it's low uh, carbohydrate uh, sweeteners or actual sugar. If you're doing one of those per day, okay, uh, that's conferring about a 20% increased uh, risk of uh, developing diabetes, okay? 
And so the low calorie sweeteners actually were called out by uh, an, an American Heart Association science advisory uh, last year. And I know they got a lot of pushback from people, but this was um, really worth uh, taking a look at, the science behind low calorie sweeteners. They basically increase insulin levels, and when they uh, put people at risk, uh, this one, this is actually from the UK, saying that the artificial sweeteners uh, increase the risk of diabetes in just two weeks. Um, well, why is that? It's higher levels of glucose, that is, when you're eating a substance and then you're drinking one of these sweeteners, the sweetener increases the absorption, and so this is the answer to the age-old question. I'm drinking the diet soda, but my weight isn't going down. It's because you're more efficient, if you want to say that, at absorbing the things that, uh, that you're eating. So your calorie count is going up by eating a no-calorie sweeter, sweetener. Okay? And so gut peptides and insulin, all increasing the risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, if I always talk about the Nurses Health Study, and this is one of the first ones that I saw. And it's relevant to the sugar uh, uh, discussion because uh, they try to analyze what are the risk factors or what are the correlates with nurses dying. And uh, it was the things that you would think, age, um, diabetes, smoking. But up in the right-hand corner, they had some, some snippets about diet. Uh, that if you're eating fiber, which I'll talk about later, about a 16% decrease in mortality. If you're eating a cholesterol load, that's a, you know, a, an animal product, about a 17% increase in mortality. But that point estimate of 17% was actually exceeded by eating a, a sugar load, uh, that glazed donut, for example, uh, a 22% increase in mortality. So this is uh, telling us that uh, sugar might be worse than animals. Well, then you have the REGARDS trial, and I throw that one in here because it's a combination of everything. It actually looked at all of the American diets, divided them into the sweet fat, um, the, uh, the, con the convenience, fast food, the uh, uh, plant-based one, which was not vegetarian, but having uh, an extra, consciously doing an extra vegetable or two. Uh, but the red line um, that's going down the cliff there is showing you that you have a large number of heart attack, stroke, and death that is surviving without a, uh, an event is depicted on the graph. And that is with the southern diet. The southern diet is a lot of sweets, a lot of uh, juices, um, fried food, organ meats. It's common in the African-American population. And that is the, the uh, the one diet that correlates best with the development of stroke and stands out among the rest of them. So what do they find? In comparison with the other terrible American diets, you had a 30% increased risk of stroke, 56% increase of, uh, of heart disease. If you had kidney disease, which the diet promotes, you had a 50% increase in death. And so that particular diet is, is spectacularly worse than the others. Now, I always take a little break in here uh, to talk to the plant-based community because um, let me just do a show of hands. I don't think I've ever done this before, but I would just really like to know. How many of you are here uh, because of your health? Okay. How many of you are here because of animal rights? Okay. Okay. Oh, standing up, are you? Okay. How many are here because of environmental concerns? Okay. And how many of you are here of, you know, because of the social issue of, you know, we feed all our grain to animals and we can solve world hunger? Okay. Well, I saw a lot of hands go up four times. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, the, but, the, but the majority of people here, and again, this be the title of the conference, uh, Real Truth About Health, uh, the majority really are concerned about health and maybe the other issues are, are slightly uh, less prominent. But... The, uh, if you go globally in the United States, uh, because we are a select population based on the course title, the problem, I would say the majority of people who do plant-based nutrition are actually concerned about the other three, if, particularly if you add them all up. And so there is this thing called an unhealthful plant-based diet done by a lot of uh, folks, and it has uh, fried food, um, you know, very, the fast food that you would pick up. Oh, I don't want the meat. I don't want to hurt an animal. I don't want the chicken nuggets. Just give me the French fries. 
Um, I mean, and so if you look at that type of diet, refined uh, flour, a lot of sugar, uh, just regular uh, orange juice, which we used to think was health, so healthy for you. Uh, what you see, uh, and it might be a little hard to see, but that dotted line on the right is the uh, incidence of heart uh, disease uh, death. It actually is above the red line, which is the animal products. So an unhealthy plant-based diet is actually worse. Uh, and this, the numbers there are very similar to what you saw with the Nurses Health Study, 22% versus 17%. Both bad, uh, unhealthy plant-based diet being worse. Uh, we had another very insightful article came, come out in 2017 that took a look at what it is that people uh, die from when they're doing uh, with an, a nutrition analysis. And at the bottom, you do see eating red meat. And anything more, that's about 14.3 grams, I think. Anything more than that in correlated with, uh, with death in men and women. And it did reach statistical significance, but it seemed, compared to the other things, to be relatively small. So there are some worse things. Above it was saturated fat. Above that is not eating enough whole grains. Above that is actually uh, having uh, the uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. Okay? And then uh, not eating enough nuts, not eating enough vegetables. And the low omega-3 really did, I believe, is a statistical phenomenon that it's not telling everyone here that you have to change your diet to eat fish. It's telling the people who are not vegans that they should be eating fish instead of the animal product, the other animal products that are more dangerous than fish. Um, then you go above that, and it's um, uh, you should be eating nuts. You should uh, not be eating. Um, uh, processed meat, and it's interesting that the slide says a high level of processed meat, but the definition of high is greater than zero, okay? And that's the way it should be. Uh, and at the top, more than 2,000 milligrams of sodium uh, for the general population. We said 1,500 for hypertensives, but uh, more than 2,000 for the general population is something to avoid. Um, one of the controversial nutrition articles that came out, uh, and there's been several of these, the PURE trials, where they look at 18, <clears throat> some, depending on where they're getting the data, some of the times the PURE trial has 19 or 21 countries, um, and excluding the United States, and putting together the data uh, on, from nutritional questionnaires and then comparing that, those with death. And I think they've been very in, insightful to have um, uh, the sort of disruptive uh, idea that people should be eating fat instead of carbohydrates is the way the press interpreted this, but that's actually not, if you read the details in the, in the PURE trial, you actually have uh, in the methods that the carbohydrates, the processed uh, sugar, processed flour, uh, white rice, these are rapidly absorbed carbohydrates, just like I was talking about 10 slides ago, and that is more dangerous than eating fat from animals. <clears throat> and so if you were to, to decrease the carbohydrate intake and continue to eat animals, your cardiovascular mortality, your total mortality would actually go down. Uh, but the best thing you could do is to take uh, your um, polyunsaturated uh, fat instead of rapidly absorbed carbohydrates, as well as de decreasing the saturated fat. Uh, they found that as well. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the politics, and a lot of this was mentioned last night, but uh, i go into it uh, a little more just because it's something that uh, concerns me. I had been working on trying to get more healthy foods, and uh, one of the congressmen, Earl Blumenauer from uh, Oregon, came up to me, uh, came to one of our American College of Cardiology meetings when I was president. He wanted to meet, he wanted to talk, um, and this is what he told me, and I kind of looked it up and just made a slide out of, you know, does the United States actually allocate money to produce junk food? And the answer is uh, yeah. And uh, if you look at it, it's billions of dollars that uh, goes towards things that will decrease the health of our population. And uh, I kind of, uh, after looking at it and, and looking at the articles, it's really just shocking 
uh, high fructose corn syrup, corn syrup, corn starch, uh, vegetable shortening. These are the things that our dollars are going uh, to make less expensive by subsidizing them, which means that they can be sold at, at lower prices, which drops the price of the product. And who then is going to eat them? It's going to be people who are underprivileged, have lower socioeconomic status, and want cheaper food. Uh, very simple. And there's the poster child. This product actually has 14 different ingredients that are subsidized by our government. And that's why uh, something as complex as that could actually be so inexpensive. OK, so if you take the hostess Twinkie um, and uh, fry it, <laughs> you can make it even more tasty. Um, you can do what Weird Al used to do, is to you know, split it and put a hot dog in the middle of it. Um, so there are worse things than a Twinkie, but uh, if you wrap it, the Twinkie around it, it's even worse. Okay, all right. So a little audience analysis, just to perk everybody up. How many calories do you think there are in that package of, of 10 Twinkies? <laughs> it's actually 1,500, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so how much spinach do you have to eat to get 1,500 calories? <laughs> so yeah, it's actually 15 pounds. And so um, you know that goes back to that Juliana Hever slide, that the calorie density is so important. And being able to um, change the, our concepts and change our eating habits isn't easy, uh, but we're trying. And so by we, I mean that uh, American College of Cardiology and uh, uh, Physicians for Responsible, a uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, who does work with the uh, District of Columbia American Medical Association, um, we all get together and we go to at our poor AMA colleagues and inundate them with nutrition stuff. And the funny thing is, I've, I've been an AMA delegate for cardiology, uh, one of four of us uh, since uh, I think 2001. And one thing I've found about the American Medical Association is they're extremely smart and extremely concerned. If you tell the House of Delegates something that's logical, that's going to help people, they always adopt it. So sure enough, they adopted our resolution to um, uh, decrease consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. So of course, now we would know, because uh, that was before the publications on low-calorie sweeteners, so it's not just sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, we've been trying to get the um, uh, hospitals to have more healthy food. Um, and we've been trying to get them to uh, promote nu nutrition. Um, that are, that's a positive nutrition in schools. And we'll just keep going after AMA policy until we can uh, help our American population and our physicians. Thank you. Um, before I leave the, the uh, sugar thing, I just want you to understand that I do know how difficult this is. Um, and I, I do remember how great it felt to sit there working uh, and looking over after I finished, uh, you know, 50, 15 or 20 charts, um, got all the notes done, and I'm looking over and that whole package of Oreos is gone. Uh, it, it really is a problem. It's dopamine in your brain, uh, as well as the sugar uh, make, giving you a sugar high. And uh, as the dopamine wears off and the insulin drives your sugar back down, you feel the only thing that makes you feel better is to do it again. And so uh, people get caught up in this sugar addiction cycle, uh, and the only way to break it is to, to try and stop it cold, um, decrease it um, very gradually and very thoughtfully, um, use a lot more water, use uh, more fruit so that there's fiber, uh, do substitutes of healthier sugars that are modulated by the fiber. Uh, so that you can uh, get out of this, and uh, hopefully everyone will avoid the concentrations of sugar that can trap them. Um, are there sweeteners? I did promise you that there, uh, there are a couple sweeteners that do not increase your insulin levels. This is one of them from the literature, uh, one of very few randomized trials of sweeteners. Uh, they were actually looking to see the effects on obesity because they knew that it would not increase insulin levels, therefore it shouldn't increase obesity. And this um, uh, substance called Yacon syrup, Yacon is a um, root from South America. And it turns out that in this randomized trial, using it for, I think it was uh, four months, resulted in about a 30-pound weight loss. 
And so um, you, know, you see people, uh, usually see people at the conference, I show this slide and I see them getting on their phone, going to Amazon and ordering it. Uh, um, it, it does taste sweet. There is one side effect you should know about, increased defecation frequency, okay? Um, so, but, but for the constipated people, that actually probably would help. Uh, but it increases satiety. That seems to be the thing that makes a difference, okay? Uh, there was another one uh, that a good friend of mine has actually uh, 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 let me know about, and I said, I'm not so sure about this erythritol stuff, um, but looked it up, and you can see that the insulin response is not zero, but it's really negative. So you don't have a lot of calories. That's another sweetener that you might consider if, you're, if you've just got to have that sweet taste, um, but you really are, are conscious of the insulin response. Okay, switching over to fats. Um, saturated fat is really something that we all should be avoiding. And um, I don't have to, I start with saturated fat instead of trans fats because I am in New York. I will mention it because I know we have an audience uh, who is not in New York. Um, and most of you from New York know what I'm talking about. But saturated fat uh, has been in the news. It's been in the New York Times, been in Time Magazine. Uh, people proposing uh, uh, not avoiding it because all of the studies saying that saturated fat is bad for you are, are studies that are flawed. Well, you know, they, they make a good point that people do not generally, sometimes they do, but generally they don't go and just start eating saturated fat. They're eating foods. And you know, if the food has cholesterol, the food has sodium, you might see health effects um, that are very dif difficult to distinguish uh, what really is the bad portion of it. But as best we can determine it, um, and uh, there is a large amount of data, if you compare populations with large amount of saturated fat to those with small amounts, uh, people do worse, uh, particularly with coronary heart disease. Now, um, if you compare specific dietary fats with uh, total and cost-specific mortality, again published in uh, Journal of American Medical Association, this is what you see. And I know there are plant-based nutrition people who say you shouldn't eat any fat at all. Okay, well, uh, I can tell you that monounsaturated fat improves your cholesterol. Polyunsaturated fat improves it even more. Trans fats are, destroy your cholesterol profile and your cardiovascular risk, and saturated fat, not quite as bad, but still bad. And increasing, uh, uh, just replacing just 5% of your saturated fat with um, monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat would actually reduce your uh, cardio cardiac mortality by about 27%. So worthwhile looking at. Okay, so I know I'm in New York, but I'll mention this anyway very quickly. Um, trans fats are so good. Easy to use, that taste is fantastic. The texture of something that's deep fried is so incredibly good. Wonderful self life if you're the, the uh, restaurant. Uh, so why are Denmark, Switzerland, Canada, California, New York, city, uh, uh, several counties here, why are they all banning it? Uh, re because it increases LDL cholesterol. It lowers your good cholesterol. It's associated with heart attack, stroke, diabetes. Other than that, it's just really good, okay? So it's one of the substances where you could do a before and after because uh, of New York uh, having such an interest in this and just look at the hospitalizations, look at the hospital records. And what you see is that when you have a county that decides it's not gonna do this anymore, um, you see a significant decrease in heart attack and stroke in a fairly short amount of time. And that's, you know, these are people's lives, these are people's brains. Uh, this is something that everyone should do, and hopefully it'll spread from New York to the entire country. The dietary fat, uh, for those of you who are getting caught up in this, um, you know, sort of storm about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the storm about uh, whether or not saturated fat is bad and, um, uh, and get into the arguments, you might want to arm yourself with the American Heart Association's presidential advisory that really looks carefully at um, the science behind it. And they admit when the science is weak, and particularly the one that came up in the discussion last night was coconut oil. They came out against it, and, but they were very clear that this is opinion of experts, okay, because the data isn't strong either way. But well, that's the only place where the data isn't strong. Um, getting away from uh, saturated fat and replacement with unsaturated fat actually does lower LDL cholesterol and lower um, uh, cardiovascular events and mortality. 
Let's talk about fiber. Um, we've mentioned how it improves uh, the insulin response, and it's important to have fiber when you're doing the sugar. Uh, but is there data specifically for high fiber diet? There actually is. And so these are multiple studies. And you can see that line of identity at 1.0. And every study is on the left side of it, some stronger than others. And when you add it up, the overall decrease that to 0.84, that's a 16% decrease in mortality. Um, uh, and it's a 10% reduction for every 10 grams per day increase in dietary fiber. So it's something that we all should do more of. Um, now, <laughs> This is an important aspect because um, uh, the fiber allows you to do carbohydrates in a way that's not as harmful. So don't process them. Don't take the husk off the rice. Don't um, uh, get rid of the, the bulky part of, of the bread uh, and try to refine it so that it's just so much, uh, so easy, so much easier to, to eat. Um, the, this particular article uh, was really important because it, it talked uh, about decreasing all-cause mortality uh, and the incidence of heart attack and stroke if you actually have high uh, carbohydrate um, uh, quality by doing a lot of dietary fiber. Okay? That sort of brings us to the uh, very contemporary issue of ketogenic diets, and uh, you, know, you can. I hope you like the way I colored the letters. Okay. okay. Um, the, oh. <laughs> it's a major issue. And I, I, I did hear today that um, the, um, uh, the interview that I did in London about this, where I said, you know, no one should do a ketogenic diet, apparently went to every ketogenic website, and you know, I'm, I'm the person who's vilified. I did see some of this on Twitter, and I spent a lot of time looking at the negative stuff about me on Twitter, because uh, the thing about it is that it's not nuclear cardiology, it's not cardiac CT, so I'm actually not the researcher. You didn't see Williams on any of these things, okay? Um, uh, so, except the hypertension guidelines, okay, I'm guilty on that one. But uh, all of this stuff is what I'm reading and uh, evaluating the science, and I put it out there. So when they attacked me for being a shill for the sugar industry, really? I would think that a ketogenic diet is actually better than sugar, believe it or not, uh, based on the data that I'm reading. Um, but I would say that uh, what we really need to focus on is whether or not this increases mortality. And uh, does it improve weight? You bet it does. This is Atkins. This is what Atkins does. Is that impressive? Yes, it is. But is it short term? That's really the issue. Uh, short-term gain and long-term uh, mortality. Um, and so there was a wonderful uh, article that tried to do several things at once, a review article, a meta-analysis, and then primary data, where they looked at um, large um, uh, data sets, such as the atherosclerotic risk in, in uh, communities, ERIC, and you put all this data together, and they came to the conclusion that high carb is bad for you, Low carb is bad for you. <laughs> and what you really should be doing is complex carbohydrates and keeping it about uh, 50 to 55% of the calories in your diet, okay? If you're doing a low carbohydrate uh, diet from animal products, it's associated with a higher mortality. And if I could go back to June of last year when I did that interview that got all over everybody, I would modify what I said to not no one should do a ketogenic diet, no one should do a ketogenic diet with animal products uh, because this study showed very clearly that if you do it with plant-derived proteins and fat, vegetables, nuts, peanut butter, whole grain breads, that's actually associated with a lower mortality. Well, what they're seeing with the ketogenic diet is not just you know, a, you know, uh, pleasing to the eye, the weight loss. They're seeing an improvement in diabetes because when the weight goes down, the insulin resistance goes down. And so that's very attractive, but you don't want to, to get that gain uh, um, metabolically and pay the price with plaque development in the coronary arteries. Okay, so if you compare the two, animal-derived uh, low-carb uh, diet, diet has about an 18% increase in mortality. If you look at the plant-based one, it's about an 18% decrease in mortality. And that is the beautiful curve that they showed, showing that it's dose-related. 
So people who do a little bit of a ketogenic diet are not as bad as the people who do moderate or severe. Uh, that's uh, the increasing mortality on the left side of the curve. On the right side, that high carb diet, and high carb again, there, every time we see that, it's the same thing. And just like the PURE trial, okay, every time you see a high carb diet, you're talking about refined carbohydrates that people should be avoiding. And so um, they, this is the, meta, uh, the analysis, the, the review of the literature showing that uh, their data is very consistent with previous publications in a nurse's health study, her uh, health professional follow-up study. Um, and this is uh, the PURE trial that really didn't look at low carb at all, but it did look at high carb. I'll keep going back to that because uh, eating sugar is bad for you. Um, the PURE trial showing that high carb is bad actually overlapped their data almost perfectly, even though it was done in 19 different countries. There is a nice systematic review of this that has even more data, and it conflicts only in terms of the amount of mortality, not the direction. And so all-cause mortality goes up, no question about it. You can look at um, uh, each of the articles and um, be convinced that there's about a 30% increase in mortality if you're doing uh, the low-carbohydrate diet. I have to throw one uh, American Heart Association journal uh, article out there because many people come to want to change their diet after a heart event. If you've had a heart attack, so-called myocardial infarction, and you do a low-carb diet, it is an 18% increase or 31%. It's actually a 53% increase in mortality. So please, tell all your heart patients, everyone you come up uh, against, uh, with this discussion, that if they have had a heart attack in the past, please do everything they can to avoid an animal-based, plant-based diet. Okay, what's wrong with it, the animal-based, plant-based diet? Well, it's got red meat in it, and this, this, that, this data is not new. Uh, it's been out there for a long time. Red meat kills, processed red meat kills faster. Uh, it's dose-related. Uh, people who say everything in moderation, well, take a look at the curve. The biggest increase in mortality, that the biggest uh, slope change in the curve is between zero and one uh, per day. Now, uh, and I've been asked this at this conference, I don't have data uh, so much on once a month or twice a month or anything like that, but once a day, definite increase in, in mortality. What's the best thing that we could do? In this data set, it was actually um, substituting nuts for processed red meat gave almost a 25% decrease in mortality. Um, what is wrong with processed meat? Well, yeah, it actually, one of the major issues is the development of heart failure. And so that is a, the heart failure incidence goes up when you're eating red meat, particularly processed meat, uh, by about 28%, um, uh, and uh, a 243% increase in, in mortality if you have heart failure. Um, so if everyone you know who has heart failure should go plant-based pretty much immediately. Now, heart failure is interesting, um, coronary heart disease, but how does it fit with overall mortality? Um, so this is the article that I probably quote more than anything else, and that is the Journal of American uh, Medical Association uh, uh, Internal Medicine that looked at the nurses' health study and the health professional follow-up study, and it gets a lot of criticism because it was done with food frequency questionnaires, as if doctors and nurses can't fill out a food frequency questionnaire. Um, the, the other major, there's two other notable uh, criticisms of this article before I show you what, what it showed. One is that those food frequency questionnaires are just noisy. That is, they, people put random responses. They know they're supposed to fill it out, but they fill it out quickly. They don't really have 24-hour re recall. They just put random stuff on there uh, and send it in. Well, anyone who's ever taken a statistics course or been in a physics lab, you know about entropy. You know about random effects. You know that if you have a random, if random noise in your sample, that's actually going to decrease your ability to make associations. It's going to decrease your ability to make a statistical significance uh, because it increases the standard error. So when you do find, uh, if you have a noisy data set and you do find a relationship, if anything, the relationship is actually stronger than what you're measuring. Okay? 
Uh, the other criticism, I think, is, is valid. That is, they called out people who have at least one cardiovascular risk factor, 131,000 of them with at least one cardiovascular risk factor. That's a, I don't know that that's a criticism. I think that's just informational, there, that there may be people with no risk factors who could eat whatever they want. But for most of us who have at least one cardiovascular risk factor, we ought to be very careful. So here's the data. At the bottom, it has other. I have no idea why processed meat increases uh, non-cancer and non-heart disease death. Is it if you eat bacon, you don't wear a seatbelt? I have no idea what that means. Okay. <coughs> but with the cancer part, there was a surprise, and that was that the World Health Organization's class one carcinogen, processed meat, had a a, a, was, had a 14% increase in mortality in this data set. And eggs actually exceeded processed meat in its relationship to cancer death. That was kind of a shock to most of us. When you move up a, a little bit and look at the cardiovascular part, you notice that, uh, for those of you who are statisticians in the audience, you notice that you know, dairy increased mortality, 0.89, that's an 11% increase. Eggs increased 12%. Fish increased mortality, 12%. But the eggs don't reach statistical significance. And why is that? Well, it's because the, the error bars are, uh, are wider, and they cross 1.0. So therefore, you can, the egg board could look at this and say, see, it's not statistically significant. Well, what makes the error bars larger is having a smaller sample size. So why would the sample size be smaller? We found out on the previous slide, because they died of cancer and dead people don't have heart attacks. Okay? So um, red meat is uh, worse than the other four, okay? um, but processed red meat has a uniquely high relationship with heart disease, and a lot of that uh, is heart failure, as we, as we noted before. If you look at the, t the top half of this uh, inset, it really is talking about all animal products. And so when I read this and I was quoted as saying, I mean, it's not really me, uh, that there are no safe animal products for human consumption, well, it, that is true if you have any cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, and processed red meat is the worst of the lot, followed by eggs, then red meat, then the rest. Okay, so what about fish? Um, why does it keep coming up as a benefit? Uh, well, there's good reason for it. The more fish people eat, the less red meat they're eating. And the more red meat they're eating, the less processed red meat they're eating. And so you can actually have gradations of what kind of you know, poison you're doing. Is it you know, heavy metal, lead versus arsenic versus you know, eating cyanide or something? You, there are gradations of things that, are, that harm human health. Um, and we should do everything we can to avoid them all. But if you're not going to avoid them all, then avoid the worst ones. And so that's why you can look at a Mediterranean diet, um, and this was published uh, years ago and then republished last summer because of some randomization issues. Uh, the new analysis came out <clears throat> very similar to the old one, that there was a 30% decrease in all-cause um, uh, incidence of cardiovascular uh, uh, events. That is, heart attack, stroke, and death were reduced over a relatively short period of time by, 5 or by 30%. And everyone talks about this. And they give the Mediterranean diet awards uh, for being the best diet. I actually would have given them the awards for doing a randomized prospective uh, trial and then publishing the results because there's just not a lot of that. Uh, we need more of it. Uh, people dedicated to that. But this was right in the manuscript. This says that there was no decrease in overall death with the Mediterranean diet. Okay. And in fact, if you look carefully at the events, um, there actually wasn't a decrease in heart attacks either. The big decrease was in stroke. Now, now that's pretty important. So, but you should tell people that if, if they're going to try to improve their health with Mediterranean diet, that they're, they're not going to live longer. You don't have to worry about your retirement funds. But what you do have to uh, be, you know, feel confident in is there's less likely that your family's going to have to push you around in a wheelchair if that's what you want. But, and, and you're helping cardiology out because you'll live long enough to have that heart attack. Okay? That's really not what we want. Okay. 
So they heard it. They heard this over and over again. The problem with the Mediterranean diet is that it contains animals and less. Uh, and so they actually, did, I think, did the right thing. People criticized this article uh, from the Predimed group uh, as being a post hoc analysis, that it wasn't the primary event. But gosh, they took the data and then they reanalyzed it for how many vegetables did you eat? Um, and they actually published a so-called pro-vegetarian food pattern inside the Mediterranean diet, and here it is. There is a mortality benefit for the Mediterranean diet if you don't eat animals. If you eat more of those, those highest two quintiles um, uh, on the right, where you're eating much more vegetables and little, if any, animal products, uh, actually does show al almost a 40% decrease in mortality. And so, yeah, the Mediterranean diet does uh, uh, save lives if you do it right, which is a plant-based Mediterranean diet. OK, how about dairy? Uh, it's worth putting in here because you saw that it seemed to be less than several of the uh, other meat products. Uh, you know that it you know, was in, originally in the Ornish diet to have low-fat dairy. It's in uh, the DASH diet that lowered blood pressure. Um, and then you had the PURE trial. Uh, coming out and saying that there is a significant decrease in mortality in the 21 countries if you're doing dairy. Um, so I think that this is a wonderful study that shows us again the, uh, the power of substitution. That if you're doing dairy instead of bacon, or you're getting calories from dairy instead of red meat, you are actually going to do substantially better. Now, they didn't do that kind of analysis to see what is it really substituting for. But there are so many candidates uh, in the pure countries, such as more calories from dairy, less calories from, from processed sugar, uh, processed flour, um, that I wouldn't be surprised that they come up with this. But if you look at the American population, people with risk factors, again, dairy itself actually increases mortality, not decreases. How about nuts? <clears throat> we have good data from the Adventist Health Studies, because I know we've, a lot of people are, are proposing that the plant uh, based diet be nut free because of the oil content and uh, I have to admit that in my practice anyone who's overweight I don't uh, have them doing nuts because the fat you eat is the fat you wear and there is monounsaturated fat and a little bit of saturated fat some polyunsaturated fat in most nuts um, but the data is pretty clear that if you're getting protein from meat that's about a 61 percent increase in mortality and if you're getting it from nuts and seeds, you have about a 40% decrease in mortality. Again, is that a substitutionary benefit? Probably. Uh, but there may be an absolute value. It's something that we would love to have a randomized prospective trial comparing nutty kinds of vegan diets versus no nuts. Uh, but we don't have that data yet. OK. All right, let's talk about cholesterol. Um, so a lot of people are thinking that white meat uh, is actually low. In cholesterol, it isn't. The other, what they call it, the other white meat, not low in cholesterol. Uh, all of these animals are about the same. Uh, salmon is a little bit less, uh, but if you could rattle off anything that comes from a plant, you'll see that there's zero milligrams. I know there's a, a little movement out there to correct the record that there, uh, along with plant sterols, there are some plants that actually make cholesterol that look chemically identical excuse me, to the cholesterol that we have in our cell walls, but it's in nanogram quant quantities. And so um, you, it wouldn't make it to one milligram because it's, you know, like four nanograms. That's way too small, or micrograms, I should say. Um, there are uh, three egg products, or three animal products that don't have cholesterol. Egg whites is one of them. Um, uh, Jello has no uh, cholesterol, and honey, of course, has no cholesterol. Um, but eggs are to really to be avoided because the amount of cholesterol in egg yolks is extremely high. And this, that one feature may be the difference between the Adventist Health Study vegan and, and uh, uh, lacto-ovo uh, vegetarian. I would imagine that the eggs are worse than the dairy uh, based on the nurse's health study. Can we do something about the cholesterol with diet? Absolutely. Um, my first foray into this with David Jenkins and the portfolio uh, diet, uh, doing a lot of plant sterols, that's like bean soup, uh, soy protein, viscous fibers, three handfuls of almonds uh, three times a day, 
and dramatic decrease in, in cholesterol over a short period of time. Uh, just two weeks later, uh, you've got about a 30% decrease in LDL. Um, the uh, C-reactor protein, that is a marker of inflammation, also goes down. And when you look at it in, in uh, large amounts of data, which Neil Barnard's group did, just adding up the world's literature, kind of blow that up for you. Bottom line is you decrease your calorie or your cholesterol increase and your cholesterol will go down, either a lot or a little or a moderate amount, but it will go down, absolutely. Let's talk about protein for a moment. Uh, we always you know, get this question, okay? We get this question all the time, do vegetables even have protein? Uh, well, they actually do, and um, the more protein uh, that you get from animals, is it worth the increase in the mortality? Probably not, uh, because you can get protein from vegetables very well. And people will argue this point and say that it's inadequate protein, it's just not uh, what humans should be doing, and um, get the, into this discussion. Do I have any nutritionists in the audience? Okay, any dietitians? Okay, all right, well, it usually is the non-plant-based dietitians that challenge this and say, particularly for our renal failure population, that they're not getting enough protein. It's okay, so where do you think the um, patient should get protein from? Well, give me an example. You say, they'll typically say steak. Okay, so where did that cow that they murdered get the protein? grass, and you can see the light bulbs going off in the, in the brain, and then they just mentioned that, you know, that cow sitting in a pasture, minding its own business, eating a lot of grass, there's a, there's a barn over in the corner, the barn's got a horse in it, what's he eating? Hay, yeah, exactly, another species of grass. Uh, and then there's a giraffe in the zoo, you know, what is it, it's, it's, it's up at the top of the tree eating something, is it squirrel eggs? No, they're eating leaves. So the largest land mammals have perfectly adequate protein intake, and they're much larger than humans, and they're completely vegetarian. So the idea that you can't get uh, protein from vegetables just never made any sense, and the dietitians sort of slink away, uh, realizing that the light bulbs have gone off, uh, that you can get uh, adequate protein from uh, plant substances. Um, a lot of people use egg whites. Really doesn't have that much protein compared to other animals, but at least there's no cholesterol. Um, but, uh, and you could probably find something more than soybeans, but any animal product that doesn't have 36 grams uh, per 100 grams like, uh, like soybeans do. And so lentils, there are a few more that could go on this list um, where the protein is actually more dense uh, than it is in animal products. A good reason not to um, uh, to eat the animals was actually brought out by the Cleveland Clinic investigators. Uh, they started talking about this about seven years ago, and I think we're at the point that they have enough data that this will become mainstream cardiology, and you'll go to the uh, doctor, and they'll measure your blood pressure, they'll do your cholesterol, and they'll measure your TMAO level. Trimethylamine in oxide is a substance, and this is a New England Journal of Medicine article, where you take the cheese, eggs, and steak, and you eat it, and uh, you're putting in choline that then gets converted in your gut to trimethylamine, which then goes to your liver and is oxidized into trimethylamine in oxide. Now, what's wrong with that compound? Pretty much everything. It does everything that you would not want in your cardiovascular system. It upsets, it creates plaque, upsets the plaque, makes the platelet, the little uh, blood clotting elements more sticky so that you form more clots. And so when you're, when you're done with this, you end up in a situation where uh, you have um, more mortality, more heart attack and stroke, and more heart failure mortality as well. So we all ought to be more concerned about that, um, and hopefully we're getting to the point where everybody's recognizing that that really is an important four-letter word. Now, I've given you a wide variety of things, that there, but there are some more, and I, I don't think that we could possibly cover everything that's ever been done in this field. Uh, Andrea uh, Woke tried in this article, uh, Hazards of Eating Red Meat. She categorized a number of articles saying that people shouldn't do red meat, and uh, a few years ago it was 450, and you can see that it goes up every year. 
And it, what's wrong with it? If, other than the strokes and the diabetes and the coronary heart disease and heart failure, not much. Okay? Worse for processed meat than for unprocessed meat. And this complicated slide, which hopefully uh, Stephen uh, will allow you to you know, take a copy of, or you could Google uh, Andrea Wolk and, and see it for yourself. Um, on the left is the TMAO. Um, in the middle is heme iron. And there's a, a bunch of compounds uh, that all come from meat um, that particularly processed meat that harm health. Um, heme iron is worth mentioning. It was in our National Institutes of Health, AARP, uh, health study that um, it actually produces reactive oxygen species. What that really means is that it's sort of oxidative damage. Uh, so please get your iron from vegetables and not from animals. Um, and that will help protect the plaque in your coronary arteries from the peroxidation and the instability that uh, uh, cause, that's, it causes. Now, uh, there's one new risk factor that uh, if you've heard me speak on this before, you haven't seen because it's relatively new. It's uh, IgE. That is a, a um, immune globulin. And it is, it's the kind of uh, immune globulin that goes up with allergies. And it turns out that there are some mammals or some humans that shouldn't eat other mammals because they develop a, an allergic response to galactose uh, alpha-1,3 galactose, and that is associated with uh, dramatically increasing the amount of coronary plaque. And so this also might become a blood test that people do to, turn, to determine if one of those people who could actually eat animal uh, products uh, safely. I should mention plaque regression because it's so important to what we do in cardiology. If we, and we've had this data for a long time. This shouldn't be a surprise. This is a 20-year-old slide showing that you take horrific cholesterol medicines with a lot of side effects um, and lower the cholesterol, and you will lower the plaque if you tolerate those medicines. Um, then in, uh, a few years later, we had better medicines, the statins at high doses, um, and you take rosuvastatin or tovastatin at high doses, and you can get over a two-year period your plaque to go down by about 50%. But how about diet? Well, diet can reduce plaque. It can also improve blood flow because it Im improves the artery function. And so the very famous Dr. Esselstyn slide where the 41-year-old anesthesiologist gets all of his plaque burden to go away uh, with diet is tremendous. Um, but um, it's something that isn't widely recognized and something that we, we really need to, to focus on. All right, so I would say that in summary, we really have uh, talked about a lot of our heart disease issues. It's uh, a burden not just in the United States, but in the entire world. It's driven by diet and lifestyle issues, but mediated by an increase in obesity and type 1 diabetes, as well as hypertension and, and, and terrible cholesterol. There really are uh, for no safe animal products for uh, those of us who have cardiac risk factors. Uh, and everyone should be avoiding processed meat, um, but all animal products to some degree, uh, trans fat, saturated fat, sugar, refined carbohydrates, all of them promote cardiovascular risk, and all of them can be removed in a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and if we could do that uh, in, in a wide a scale, we would change that, you know, if you've ever seen these curves of health, uh, healthiness of the population versus expenditures, the United States is the one outlier where we spend a massive amount and have terrible health of our population. We could change that, uh, and it would be great for our, for our country. I, and I really do, I've said it over and over again, um, that everyone should do plant, whole food, plant-based diet uh, as, a, uh, as a patriotic duty to the United States of America. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're supposed to go around with microphones and uh, and do questions. All right. Um, oh, how are? You? Yeah, hi. Uh, that happened last night. 
I did it. <coughs> All right. Somebody has the microphone? Oh, there you go. Very quick question. One of your early slides, like the third or fourth, had something about the reasons we have more issues these days are because of fast food, screen time, and less exercise because our jobs are desk jobs. The very last or second to last on that same screen said something about temperature. And I was wondering what that meant. So it turns out, um, and I, you know, I'm not really an expert at that portion of it, but that's listed as one of the things. And uh, somebody's hand going up because they know the answer to it. Oh, so okay. So the issue, as I understand it, is that people um, like a colder room, which you would think would increase the um, metabolic rate to try to maintain heat, uh, but it seems to have the opposite effect, and people sort of relax more, um, and so people end up burning less calories, maybe because they're just moving less. Um, so I, I, it seems paradoxical to me, and uh, if anybody can explain that to me, that'd be great. <laughs> Uh, that, that actually, if you saw the reference on it, uh, well, I can say that I always like warm rooms and I can't keep a pound on. So, <laughs> so I believe them, I just don't know what the mechanism is. I see. All right, well, feel free to email me if you find the answer. Uh, so I think this gentleman. Thank you, that was fantastic, Kim. That was great. Listen, um, tell us about taurine, the vegetarians, tell us about taurine, and is cream safer than milk? Heavy cream, no carb. So taurine? Just a lipid. Taurine. Oh, taurine. 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 Yeah. yeah, the amino acid taurine. Yeah, um, yeah this came up last night, uh, and uh, all it does is bring back a little bit of PTSD. <laughs> PTSD for me because it was I, I learned a big lesson. I was vice president of the American Heart of American College of Cardiology, and uh, someone um, was talking about uh, taurine and how it could actually improve uh, the function of the heart. And it was an MRI study, and uh, they interviewed me about it because I'm a cardiovascular radiology person, and I was saying that you know, you, looking at the ejection fraction and looking at improvement of the function of the heart might be good, but it might be a bad thing. It might be that long-term you end up burning out your heart. And so uh, let's do a long-term study and find out what's going on. You know, you, it needs to be studied more. So the funniest part about that is about three months later, I got another call talking, like, talking about energy drinks containing taurine and caffeine and the heart effects. And I got on there and I said, you know, we need more studies. We can't, you know, we can't make any definitive uh, uh, statements about it until there are more studies. Whew. The problem was they weren't talking about uh, improvement of ventricular function. They were talking about sudden cardiac death. And that report came out saying that Dr. Williams says that we need more studies even though people have died. Whoa. <laughs> so I learned a big lesson. All right. So um, that... A little unnecessary anecdote is probably for anyone who's going to talk with the media, get very clear what it is they're talking about before you respond. Um, and so the, the concerns that I have about this, the use of it in, uh, in energy drinks is, is uh, I think, a real one because it causes rhythm disturbances. Is it the taurine alone? Is it taurine plus the caffeine? Is it the taurine, uh, caffeine, and sugar, okay, that combination? So I, I would not be a fan of doing this until there are studies showing that it's safe. All right. Yes. Um, with the exception of what the uh, mass media has been saying, I have never heard anything healthy being said about polyunsaturates, uh, especially when you cook with them, they create loads of free radicals. Everybody's saying monounsaturates. Um, yet you had studies citing that polyunsaturate consumption lowers heart disease risk? What kind uh, yes. of polyunsaturates are we referring to? Because I've never heard anything like that. So that actually is the, uh, the fat advisory, and so I encourage you to look it up. But my understanding is that there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. That is, when you take a polyunsaturated or monounsaturated oil and you cook it at high heat, you're breaking double bonds all the time. You're making it more saturated, and you're making it more atherogenic. And so uh, not a fan of cooking oil or frying uh, 
things at all. I'm, I, I, I have to say one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Avocado oil has a smoke point of uh, 500 degrees. So I think the polyunsaturates are worse culprit than uh, the monoids, especially with specific oils like avocado oil. Interesting. Um, yeah. It's when the smoking point is when they become carcinogenic. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a really good point, that that slide was only talking about the effect on uh, cholesterol and heart disease, nothing about cancer. Yes, sir. You mentioned that the plant-based ketogenic diet can reduce mortality by 18% versus an animal-based ketogenic increases uh, mortality by 18%. Mm -hmm. Lancet right. Public Health, September right. of last year. Mm -hmm. Now, for somebody who, uh, uh, <coughs> who is on this uh, completely plant-based uh, with the grains and uh, beans involved, what is the mortality uh, change? Decrease. I missed the two said. You said beans and grains. Well, right. I mean, if you if you are completely plant based, you avoid the oils. You have the nuts. You have the beans, and you have the grains, and you have the fruits and vegetables, which is which is low carb, plant based, but it's not like ketogenic plant based. Okay. So, uh, how does that compare with the ketogenic plant based diet? So I I don't know that there's any any data. Uh, specifically, I, it sounds like a, you know, a good logic. Cardiology, we get burned by logic all the time, so um, I would always want more data uh, before giving an answer to something like that. Right, so the ketogenic diet allows you some fat versus... Oh, yeah, I mean, that, well, the plant-based diet that Shikani's article talked about, right. that had, like, peanut butter and vegetable oil and the like uh, as a source of fat, as and the, then beans and, the, and nuts as the source of, uh, of plant-based protein. Right, and right. it seemed to be decreasing mortality. Now again, it's decreasing relative to what? It's relative to the standard diet. And so could you have done a 60% improvement if you just stopped doing ketogenic diet at all, completely? Uh, no way to answer that from that data set. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, yes sir. So, you know, this might go faster if you guys pick out the next person and just give them the microphone. Yeah. There you go. I, yes, thank, sir. thank you, Dr. Williams. It's always great to see you and hear you. Thank you for everything you do. Um, Two-fold question, or two questions. For an individual who's compliant in a whole food plant-based diet, except his one downfall is the sugar aspect. Mm -hmm. And yep. I saw the data. Thank you. Um, you know, could I, is it? Possible, I could have sugar maybe once a month instead of once a week, or or do I really need to just give up on this idea and just start to go without sugar? Is one main question. The other one, and I probably need to. I know what I need to do, but but seriously, the other one. This is for a friend of mine. So I am whole food, plant based. No, 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 no. No, that one was for me. I know what I need to do. But for my friend, I'm trying to mentor someone who's thinking about going whole food, plant based. He's 55, he's had a heart attack, he's got a stent. His heart capacity is 34%, but his cardiologist is telling him, don't have green leafy vegetables because you'll have too much vitamin K. So I wanted your thoughts on that. Okay, so let's start on the vitamin K issue. Um, so, um, but I gotta go back to what you said. So I, I, I did go to school at University of Chicago where Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was there, uh, you know, the death and dying and the five stages of grief. And what you just described was the bargaining <laughs> form. <laughs> okay, you, you, you're, you're, you're beyond denial, but it's, you've got to get to acceptance at some point, <laughs> okay. Um, and so, uh, it's, but to answer that question, um, I actually do, you know, there's a, my, my favorite vegan restaurant has these beautiful uh, vegan brownies. Uh, I will buy one and eat half of it at once a month, you know, and, and, you know, but my excuse for doing that is occasionally I want some insulin to try to drive more nutrients in there because I, I work too much, I don't eat enough, and I play too much tennis, and I'm 30 pounds below my playing weight from, uh, uh, from when I was a pro tennis player, and I'd like some of that back, so, but sugar probably is not the way to get there. Um, the, uh, so, the other side of, um, 
uh, of, you know, the, with the sugar addiction, it's very difficult for people. Uh, and I understand that uh, behaviorally, culturally, it's very difficult uh, to make that change. And you know, the probably, I would say, the number one thing that helps people get over it really is switching more to fruit and saying, you know, I'm not going to have that ice, that vegan ice cream. I'm going to have a banana or something like that. It seems to work. Now, there was another part of your question. Um, right. Yeah, I didn't want to skip that one. So um, the vitamin K antagonist, warfarin, is really important uh, that people who have the conditions that need it, uh, that you watch the vitamin K uh, intake. The cardiologist should be not saying absence or abstinence. They should be saying consistency. That means really taking it seriously. I mean, take your calendar, put it on the refrigerator, and map out how many salads, how many mustard greens, how many spinach, kale, all of it. Put it up there and make sure that it's consistent. If not day to day, certainly week to week. And that's, that's a burden to put on people, but that's the nature of that drug. Um, that drug is really difficult for us in the United States and other countries, but we have one of the worst track records. You measure it, so so-called TTR, the time in the therapeutic range in the United States with that drug is about 60%. That means 40% of the time people are at risk because their, uh, their uh, anticoagulation is too high, which causes the intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, and the other half of the time, they're under the, th the therapeutic range, meaning that they're going to get a clot and perhaps a stroke. Um, the, the best news in that whole issue is that we have four new drugs, non novel anticoagulants, that are able to get around the use of warfarin for so many conditions. There are some that, like uh, artificial mechanical valves, where we don't have any data, and I don't think we're actually going to get data anytime soon about their use, but the usual things like a clot in the leg or atrial fibrillation. You, have, you know, everybody's heard of that. It's on television. Do you have AFib? It's a really important cause of stroke, uh, and those can be handled very well with the, the novel uh, oral anticoagulants and get around this whole issue of, of warfarin. I have a question. <coughs> mm -hmm. yes. I've, we've heard all the saturated fats and everything, but I have a question. What about mayo? What about mayo? mayonnaise? Mayonnaise. Um, so it's in a lot of food. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. So interestingly enough, there uh, there is there are brands of vegan mayonnaise that people can buy. Uh, they don't go on a no fat diet. If you're overweight, I would not recommend them. Uh, but I certainly would eat them because I'm always trying to gain weight. Um, if you are careful about the content, please flip it over, look at the sodium content, look at the fat content, uh, and if it's not something that you shouldn't be doing, uh, where, and where do I draw the line? Is central obesity. If you've got something extra there, you probably don't need to, to eat that sort of thing. Okay. All right. We're good. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay.